Item number SCP-2363 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Area 63 has been established to contain SCP-2363, and is surrounded by a 4-meter-tall barbed wire fence. The perimeter is to be patrolled and monitored by on-site armed personnel. Any damage to the fence is to be reported immediately. SCP-2363-A is not to be allowed within 5 meters of the perimeter fence. Deadly force may be used to maintain this distance. SCP-2363-A should be treated as hostile. If any instances of SCP-2363-B are observed within the perimeter of SCP-2363, they are to be removed immediately. Any civilian personnel found attempting to breach the perimeter fence are to be detained for questioning. No female personnel are to be assigned to Area 63. SCP-2363 refers to an area of roughly one square kilometer in south-central Wyoming. A small dilapidated farmhouse stands at the approximate center of SCP-2363. Personnel who have spent extended periods of time within SCP-2363 report extreme fatigue. Longer than six hours. SCP-2363-A is a humanoid entity that lives in the farmhouse and claims to be the owner of SCP-2363. SCP-2363-A is anatomically an elderly human male, with an apparent growth defect resulting in the absence of lips, leaving its teeth and gums exposed. SCP-2363-A's eyes are severely cataracted, rendering it blind. Although this appears to have a negligible effect on SCP-2363's ability to perceive its environment. If SCP-2363-A is removed from SCP-2363 and is unable to return, it will immediately and continuously attempt to kill itself until it succeeds, resorting to biting out its own veins or repeatedly bashing its skull against the wall if necessary. SCP-2363-A has on several occasions attempted to kill Foundation personnel with its hands and teeth, but as of yet has not been successful. SCP-2363-B designates the 11 women, ages 26-34, originally found within SCP-2363 when it was discovered in 1967. Each instance of SCP-2363-B was matched to a recent missing person report from Wyoming, Colorado, or Utah. SCP-2363-B instances were extremely sedate, and wandered SCP-2363 without direction. They also did not require food or water while within SCP-2363. Ten months after the discovery of SCP-2363, each of the ten surviving instances of SCP-2363-B was removed from the area, and quickly recovered from their sedation. All SCP-2363-B instances were unable to recall their time within SCP-2363, or how they arrived there. Removed instances have been found to be unable to conceive, despite the absence of any apparent problems with the reproductive systems. Each instance was administered Class D amnestics, and was delivered to the authorities in several nearby towns. These instances should be monitored for further anomalous phenomena. If SCP-2363-A dies for any reason, one instance of SCP-2363-B will rapidly grow heavily pregnant and give birth to a tumorous mass, which will quickly grow into an adult SCP-2363-A. This process occurs very quickly, with an average duration of 28 seconds from death to complete regrowth. This birthing process appears to be very painful to SCP-2363-B, but is not usually fatal. This process has been observed 15 times, and has only resulted in death once. See Log of Incident 2363-04 for further details. Selected Incident Logs for SCP-2363 Incident 2363-02 SCP-2363-A is shot in the chest four times while attempting an attack on Foundation personnel constructing the perimeter fence. SCP-2363-A dies, 
In an instance of SCP-2363-B gives birth to a new instance of SCP-2363-A, who retreats into the farmhouse. Incident 2363-04 Research personnel attempt to remove SCP-2363-A from SCP-2363. SCP-2363-A kills itself while in transit the site by smashing its head into the side of the transport vehicle until dead. An instance of SCP-2363-B grows pregnant and dies during the birth of a new instance of SCP-2363-A. SCP-2363-A returns to the farmhouse. Incident 2363-09 all instances of SCP-2363-B are removed from the area, and a research team is sent in to attempt an interview with SCP-2363-A. SCP-2363-A attacks the team and attempts to bite a security officer. SCP-2363-A is shot in the head by Security Officer Angela Jones and dies. After three minutes, Security Officer Jones collapses and reports extreme abdominal pain. Shortly thereafter, an instance of SCP-2363-A erupts fully grown from her abdomen, killing her. Remaining team members retreat from the area. Note, female personnel are no longer to be assigned to Area 63. Incident 2363-14 Second team is sent in to interview SCP-2363-A. SCP-2363-A does not cooperate and attacks the team. SCP-2363-A is killed by a shot to the head, and no personnel sustain serious injuries. The team leaves the area, and no activity is reported for approximately 73 hours. An instance of SCP-2363-A is then observed to claw its way to the surface from beneath the ground. Instance appears extremely agitated and rushes the perimeter fence. SCP-2363-A is unable to scale the fence, and retreats to the farmhouse after several hours. This spontaneous generation occurs after all subsequent instances of SCP-2363-A's death. Incident 2363-25 A third and final team is sent in, and successfully managed to conduct an interview with SCP-2363-A. The team is invited into the farmhouse where the interview takes place. The interview concludes when SCP-2363-A attacks members of the team. See below for a transcript of this interview. Note, no further personnel are to enter SCP-2363 at this time. Interview Log 2363-25 Interviewed, SCP-2363-A Interviewer, Senior Researcher Roberts Forward. Interview conducted within SCP-2363 after six unsuccessful attempts. The reasons behind SCP-2363-A's sudden cooperation are currently not understood. Begin Log Hello, 2363-A. Time will do just fine, boy. Would y'all like anything? Tea? No, thank you. We just need to ask you a few questions. Sure, boy. What'd you want to know? Well, to start, what can you tell us about this land? What's there to tell? Tom just lives here. Ain't much else to say. How did you get here? Why, Tom was born here. And when was that? <laughs> oh, quite a while now. Long before y'all got here. Our organization? Sure, sure, but longer than that. Tom was talking more about your kind. You mean humans? Oh, them too, yes, but even longer than that. Tom's been on this land just about longer than anyone can remember. He was here before the hairy folk died out, and before the Black Horde themselves marched across these plains. Tom's been here before there even were planes. Can you tell me why you've been so hostile to our personnel in the past? Well now, Tom don't take too kindly the trespassers coming onto his land and taking his wombs and building fences over the place. 
Well, we've determined that this area and those women warrant containment and monitoring. Tom begs to differ. Tom wasn't hurting nobody, and he'd sincerely appreciate it if you gave him back what's his. I'm afraid we can't do that at this time. Well, that's a shame. SCP-2363-A remains quiet for several seconds, and then lunges at Researcher Roberts and attempts to bite into his neck. SCP-2363-A is forcibly removed by security personnel. Interview is concluded. End log. Item number SCP-1202 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures The subject exposed to SCP-1202 is to be quarantined from other site staff and personnel, unless outfitted with clothing completely covering their entire body. A skin suit is equipped to the exposed subject after transfer of SCP-1202. The afflicted subject is to transfer access to SCP-1202 to one other test subject before termination or death. It is recommended SCP-1202 be tested on D-Class already scheduled for termination. SCP-1202 was recovered beneath a frozen lake near Site in Canada. Personnel reported trouble sleeping and auditory hallucinations that often reference the location of SCP-1202. A team was sent to investigate the lake, based on the collected reports. A small wooden canoe was discovered in fragments on the lake bed next to an irregular ice formation. The chamber behind the blockage was empty, save for the frozen and emaciated remains of the body of one human male, later DNA tested and carbon dated, thusly identified as belonging to tribes once native to the lower portion of South America 800 years ago. The corpse itself has no interesting properties, except the position of the body. One hand is fixed on the forehead, and the other appears to be working a now absent object into its ear canal. Whether the cause of death is suicide or cold is unconfirmed. The agent who first made physical contact with the corpse began to hear a voice that did not cease until he made contact with another human. The exposed D-Class reported hearing the voice at their grasping agent hand and indefinitely afterwards. The exact mechanism that enables this transfer is unknown, as is the manner in which SCP-1202 communicates with the subjects. SCP-1202 will converse with the afflicted subjects, lecturing them about a variety of topics, notably theoretical physics, biology, and the classified study of The psychological effect tends to be detrimental as the voice rarely ceases to talk for periods any longer than 20 seconds. The current D-Class responsible for bearing SCP-1202 requested to be euthanized at one week. The voice classified as SCP-1202 identifies itself as a former researcher at Site-18. Whether or not SCP-1202 is Dr. B is still being debated. Although inquiries expressed to test subjects bearing SCP-1202 match archived profiles of the late researcher. Documentation Transcription from Agent B Forward Agent B began hearing the voice while in the company of the coroner who was examining the body found in the cave. Agent B notified the site director. He was then tasked to record his initial conversation with SCP-1202. Hello. Can you hear me? I know you can hear me. Oh good. I've been expecting someone to come along, and here you are. You touched him, didn't you? My old friend? Yes, him. The one I had the falling out with ages ago? I was just having a conversation with him, and then you came along. What? Him? The frozen one with the splinter in his head? Oh yes, of course he's dead. Are you stupid? Stupid one he was too, my old friend. No offense to him, but it's true. Love him to death, that stupid one. He thought he could run. He ran all the way here. The man crossed an entire continent to get away from me. Ended up in a hole in the ice jamming a pick into his ear. 
I told him not to, again and again. Who am I? I'm… Who am I? I'm responsible for… The entire organization owes a great debt to me. Hmm. Of course you're interested. Yes, I'll tell you. But first I'd like to chat about things that we can both understand. Do you see that man in front of you? Yes, the one with the beard? I'm going to need you to kill him for me. Yes, I'm serious. How else will we get into headquarters undetected? He has the keycard. He has access to the… And once I get to it, I could be done with all this mess. No? I should have figured you weren't the type. Oh well. No, don't tell him you're hearing things. What? You already did. Are you an idiot? How long have you been working here to be stupid enough to tell them you're hearing things? Ah. <sighs> Well, at least I know why you're recording what I'm saying. I figured you were just insane to begin with. That's a relief. You know, they're going to throw you into one of those rooms now. They'll have you drink that gel that that perverted doctor isn't allowed to touch. Worse, they'll keep me in here. I'm just far too interesting for them to get rid of. How? That is a good question. Although you are too stupid to understand. Let's say I was playing with strings and struck a wonderful note. Yes, I'm referring to that, you dunce. You're familiar with the concept. Sure, I bet you're familiar with the theory of relativity too. Familiar like I'm familiar with my strange uncle. I mean, learned, my stupid friend. Learned and familiar. Like how I'm familiar with your brain. No, technically I'm not alive. Not in a biological sense. No. You wouldn't understand. The Aztec Man? I'm guessing roughly 1,000 years ago. Yes, I failed miserably at poking sticks into space-time. What? No! I'm not going to explain. You wouldn't understand. No, I'm not going anywhere. We've hardly even met. How rude of you. Note, he's humming now. He won't stop humming. He's been humming loudly for several hours. Item number SCP-906 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Subject is to be contained in a 3 by 3 m squared, fully airtight, 12 cm thick titanium enclosure, surrounded by acid-resistant glass. Temperature must be kept under 5 degrees Celsius. Should temperature exceed this limit? All personnel are to be evacuated to a distance of at least 100 meters. Immediate area containing enclosure will then be locked down until temperature has been lowered. Holding cell is to be maintained on a bi-weekly basis, and checked for sufficient corrosion or gaps. Any damage to holding cell is to be repaired immediately. SCP-906 is to be monitored at all times from four digital cameras mounted on each corner of the enclosure. Any abnormal behavior reported from these cameras will result in immediate lockdown of area around containment cell. Access to SCP-906 is permitted only to supervised Class D personnel for feeding and or enclosure maintenance. SCP-906 is to be fed 80 kg of raw meat every 42 hours. Description: SCP-906 is a writhing mass of dark brown, worm-like invertebrates. These organisms seem to interact in a uniform fashion, forming a colonial superorganism in a similar manner to army ants. For reasons currently unknown, SCP-906 will usually form its body into that of a very rough humanoid figure. SCP-906 is shown to be capable of crude bipedal movement when in this state. However, when traveling longer distances, it will deviate to a flattened mass with a greater efficiency of movement. SCP-906 is capable of secreting a viscous, highly corrosive, semi-translucent fluid, similar in color to its skin. This substance is shown to have an acidic strength comparable to hydrofluoric acid, but it has a less pronounced effect on titanium. No effect on acid-resistant glass, and 
This substance displayed the ability to destroy teeth, bones, hair, nails, clothing, jewelry, and some kinds of equipment in under an hour. SCP-906 is predatory, and highly aggressive. When hungry, it will swarm over any living creature within its path, and coat them in its acidic secretion, thereby breaking down the matter into a liquid slurry, which it then consumes. Attempts to remove or disturb SCP-906 during its feeding have proved fruitless. When a designated prey is nearby, SCP-906 will alter its form into that of a flowing carpet and move across any surface in order to pursue its target until the prey is captured. Due to the small width of SCP-906 component organisms, 2 cm wide, barriers will only slow its advance. Obstacles that cannot simply be passed will be destroyed by the acidic substance SCP-906 secretes. SCP-906 has also displayed the ability to take alternate routes to reach its prey, such as drainage pipes and ventilation shafts. Through methods currently unknown, SCP-906 appears capable of mimicking animal-like sounds and parroting human speech and was described as a raspy, hoarse voice while in its humanoid form. SCP-906 appears to use its ability to lure prey into areas that are difficult to escape, such as deep pits or maze-like corridor networks. Eyewitness reports for Containment Breach 906-2-10-01A detail SCP-906 taunting prospective victims and even emitting a sound something like laughter before attacking its prey. This behavior suggests a kind of rudimentary sentience, but it is unknown how a creature comprising several thousand individual organisms is able to achieve this. SCP-906 specimens, when removed from the larger body, will attempt to move back towards the central mass and have been known to dissolve through any obstacles in their way. It should be noted that individual specimens do not show the same level of navigation skills as the full superorganism. Specimens of SCP-906 have the ability to reconstruct into multiple versions when damaged in a similar manner to common earthworms, such as splitting one SCP-906 specimen resulted in each half growing into separate organisms. Despite this, SCP-906 specimens have been destroyed via means of incineration, freezing, and full-body disintegration. Should the need to destroy SCP-906 ever arise, use of flamethrowers or liquid nitrogen is permitted. However, SCP-906 specimens will split themselves and multiply over the course of several hours should the larger mass be severely reduced. If SCP-906 is ever required to be terminated, all specimens must be eliminated to prevent SCP-906 reforming. In order to keep SCP-906 in a more controllable state, the enclosure it is housed in is to be kept at a temperature below 5 degrees Celsius at all times, as this is shown to reduce the movement, reaction time, reproduction abilities, and metabolism of SCP-906. Addendum 906-05-01 Testing of SCP-906 resulted in a Class D being targeted before a cow. A second test was then conducted in this manner, wherein a pig, sheep, dog, and horse were all placed alongside a Class D. SCP-906 once again targeted the Class D first. Second targeted animal was the pig, followed by the sheep, the horse, and finally the dog. Addendum 906-05-02 During routine enclosure maintenance, SCP-906 reportedly spoke to a supervising staff member by saying his name several times. The reason it did this is unknown, and the staff member, one Dr. Anthony Richards, reports being very disturbed by the proceedings and has expressed a desire to be kept away from SCP-906 in the future.
Item Number SCP-932 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-932-01-6-08 are to be kept in a 15m by 15m room with observational windows, furnished with a speaker and a bed with straps. During an observation, experimentation, or interaction session, the speaker is to play a tone of 510Hz at 100dB, rated as loud, to enable visibility of SCP-932. Noise-canceling headphones are available to participating staff on request to facilitate communication. Once every three days, a D-Class personnel is to sleep in the bed in SCP-932's chamber for feeding purposes. The speakers need not be turned on for this purpose. The feeding process is never fatal. However, the straps can be utilized in case of resistance on part of the D-Class. Said personnel can be returned to normal duties afterwards. Wild instances of SCP-932 are to be tracked down and captured alive by MTF IOTA-4 Dream Hunters. Edit. Following Incident 932-002, containment breach protocols have been set. The 510Hz tone is to be played throughout the site if a breach occurs, and all air vents or possible escape routes are to be sealed. All on-site personnel are advised to keep as calm as possible. The following changes are also to be made to SCP-932's containment. The speaker is to be affixed to the wall and play the aforementioned tone at all times, and that a different D-Class personnel be used for each feeding session. Description. SCP-932 are creatures able to adjust the refractive indices of their bodies in order to appear invisible. This ability seems to be disrupted when SCP-932 is exposed to sound. A loud, 100 decibel tone of 510 Hz neutralizes it completely. When visible, SCP-932 resemble pale and featureless children. Their height varies from 1.2 to 1.6 meters, and weigh approximately 30 to 40 kilograms. In large numbers, SCP-932 have been able to pin down and fully immobilize an adult human. SCP-932 hunts by silently following an individual to his or her dwelling in groups of no more than eight individuals. If necessary, SCP-932 will lie in wait near or under the victim's bed for several hours until he she falls asleep and enters a state of rapid eye movement REM sleep. When the victim enters this state, the pack of SCP-932 will pin the victim down, secreting an unknown pheromone that causes the victim to wake before the REM cycle is complete. These effects are highly similar to other anomalies which prey on victims during REM cycles or cause paralysis during sleep, such as SCP-966, SCP-3060, and SCP-122. In most cases, the victim will be conscious but immobile, leading to a general feeling of panic. Initially, it was thought that SCP-932 fed on hormones produced by the panicking victim, but Experiment 932-04 Tau Test seemed to prove otherwise. SCP-932, for all intents and purposes, feeds on fear. It is unknown how this mechanism works, or how it detects REM sleep in its victims. SCP-932 is generally docile and does not actively attack researchers. However, if its feeding schedule is disrupted for more than 21 days, it will seem to be more aggressive and alert to its surroundings, and on occasion has tried to subdue researchers entering its containment chamber, despite the researcher being completely awake at the time. Edit. It appears that SCP-932 prefers variation in its diet as they seem to be more placid at the beginning of the month, when a new D-Class personnel is introduced, than at the end. Suggesting five D-Class be assigned to our team and taking turns in the feeding session. Researcher Min Permission under consideration, given light of your recent budget scandal. Director Faisal Permission granted, following events of Incident 932-02. Director Faisal Incident Report 932-02 Date June 29, 1998 Location 
Site-09 Biological Division, South Wing, No. 03-02 14-0023 Research Assistant Biantara prepares to enter containment chamber for weekly vacuuming. He appears to mumble under his breath. Body language shows apprehension. Record shows that Biantara was a new hire and had little experience with SCPs. 14-0057 510 Hz tone plays. Biantara is given the all-clear. SCP-932 become visible. 14-0118 Biantara turns on vacuum cleaner and enters containment chamber. SCP-932-01-06 immediately turn to face him and slowly moves towards his direction. He appears startled by this reaction, quickly waving the vacuum cleaner around him in an attempt to keep SCP-932 at bay. 14-0301 SCP-932-03 tackles Biantara's leg from behind, causing him to collapse. The other SCP-932 individuals leap on him and keep him down on the floor, apparently initiating a feeding event. Biantara is visibly struggling under the combined weight of SCP-932, accidentally disconnecting the speaker's plug with his kicking feet. SCP-932 are now invisible. 14-0313 Site security alerted, and observational cameras are switched to IR mode. The members of SCP-932 are still feeding. 14-0350 Site security arrive, but are told not to enter the containment chamber until the feed from the IR camera is loaded into their HUDs. 14-0548 Research Assistant Biantara ceases movement. IR feed shows the pack of SCP-932 lose interest and leave his body. Five members of Site Security enter chamber and disable active members of SCP-932. A preliminary survey revealed that SCP-932-06 was unaccounted for. 14-0551 Biantara recovered from containment chamber. Pulse is weak and rapid, and his eyes are wide open and rapidly moving. On closer inspection, his pupils appear dilated despite the bright conditions of the chamber. 14-0600 Site lockdown initiated. All personnel advised to remain calm. Site security dispatch for retrieval. 14-0638 The 510 Hz tone is played on the site speakers. Visibility of SCP-932-01-05 confirmed. 14-0651 Multiple motion sensors activated in south wing air ducts. 14-0846 Camera feed shows SCP-932-06 exiting from an air duct in corridor 3A of the south wing. Security team prepares for retrieval. 14-0902 Camera feed shows another SCP-932 exiting from an air duct in corridor 3D of the south wing. Director Faisal expresses possibility of SCP-932 reproduction. The 510 Hz tone is played through the air ducts via a speaker in the biology office to aid retrieval procedures. 14-0932 Camera feed shows another SCP-932 exiting from an air duct in corridor 4P of the south wing. Additional security team dispatched to contain both new instances. 14-1107 Containment of three individuals achieved. Sensors report no more movement in air ducts. The two new individuals are labeled SCP-932-07 and-08, and are contained along with SCP-932-01-06. Research Assistant Biantara is in a comatose state, and displays no change in behavior. Further observations required. Note, after 47 days on life support, Biantara appeared to mouth something and his eyes ceased movement. He died of cardiac arrest shortly afterwards. I think he said something like, too scared to move. Research Assistant Patayong Item Number SCP-4419 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures 
Due to the expansive range of circumstances in which SCP-4419 manifestations occur, containment efforts are to focus on information control and post-manifestation cleanup, rather than physical imprisonment. Any witnesses to an SCP-4419 manifestation are to be dosed with a Class B or Class A amnestic, as appropriate for their level of exposure. In cases where it is possible to restore the bodies of SCP-4419 victims to roughly standard human configurations, a cover story is to be established to explain any remaining damage as a result of their original injuries. In cases where this is not feasible, victims of SCP-4419 are to be brought into custody and, if possible, euthanized. A cover story is then to be established regarding the death of the victim due to their original injuries or conditions. Description: SCP-4419 is a vehicle resembling an ambulance of Barry and Megan model, which will spontaneously appear in an area shortly before a medical emergency rises. The means by which SCP-4419 predicts these situations is currently unknown. Although the appearance of SCP-4419 differs from manifestation to manifestation, it will always resemble an ambulance appropriate for the local culture. Upon the occurrence of the medical emergency, SCP-4419 will proceed directly to the injured individual, hereafter referred to as the victim. Two individuals of varying physical appearances in paramedic uniforms will then exit from the back of SCP-4419, secure the victim, and bring them back with them into SCP-4419. The individuals that emerge from SCP-4419 will behave as expected for a medical professional in the situation, but will repel any attempts by others to prevent them from securing the victim via extreme physical force. Once the victim has been secured within SCP-4419, it will leave the area at extreme speeds, disappearing the moment it is outside of observation. Two to seven days later, the victim will be returned outside a local area suffering from extreme and invasive bodily modifications. Although the majority of these alterations would logically result in the death of the victim, death will not occur in these cases unless the modifications are tampered with or otherwise undone. The specific nature of these modifications differs from case to case, although there does appear to be a level of correlation with the original medical emergency. See Encounter Log 4419-1. Encounter Log 4419-1 The following is a log of encounters with SCP-4419, the original medical emergencies in each area, and the bodily modifications applied to the victim. Note that this log does not encapsulate all known SCP-4419 victims, and a full record is available upon request from the Data Archive at Site-31. Date: Medical Emergency Bodily Modification February 7, 1983. A braking car hits a pedestrian crossing the street, resulting in a broken leg. Victim returned with all limbs amputated and relocated to protrude directly from his torso. Limbs were re-amputated and a cover story was established to explain the loss of limbs as a result of a much more severe car accident. November 23, 1994. A man suffers from a broken jaw following a fight outside a bar. Victim returned with his jaw force permanently open. In addition, a glass window was installed in the mouth to permit viewing of the heart, which had been relocated to the back of the throat. Due to the relocation of the heart, reversion of the body modifications was not possible, and the victim was euthanized. June 19, 1999 A homeless man suffers from a drug overdose. Victim returned to the same place he was originally taken from. The top of the victim's skull had been removed, and the brain crudely scooped out and placed into the victim's hands, which had been fused together in front of him. While being brought into custody, the victim's brain fell out of his hands and he instantly expired. Note that at no point was the victim's brain actually connected to his nervous system. January 29, 2003 a wife and husband involved in a car crash suffer numerous broken bones and severe bleeding. Victims returned fused together by their backs. 
all bones that had been broken in the original accident were meticulously removed, resulting in the loss of use of some limbs. The victims were successfully separated, administered amnestics as appropriate, and their modified limbs were amputated. February 15, 2006 An elderly man suffers from a heart attack. Victim was returned with eleven additional and non-functional hearts within his body stuffed between his existing organs. Expiration occurred when surgeons attempted to remove these additional hearts before agents could arrive on the scene. Surgeons and medical staff who had treated the victim were administered amnestics, and the body confiscated. September 19, 2008 A fire at a bar results in 19 people suffering from severe burns. An additional seven people suffer from skull fractures and broken bones when they attempt to confront the individuals who emerge from SCP-4419, and are also taken as victims. It is believed existing injuries were exasperated, and new injuries caused, by attempting to force 26 people into the limited space with an SCP-4419. Victims return to the local community center as a single watery mass which twitches and shivers when physical contact is applied. As no method of euthanizing the victims could be found, they are currently stored in a liquid tank at Site-31. November 24, 2014 A U.S. military private is shot while on patrol in Afghanistan. Due to the suspicious nature of SCP-4419's arrival and the forceful securing of the private, other soldiers on the patrol fire upon SCP-4419 as it leaves. Witnesses report seeing a viscous black fluid leaking from the resultant bullet holes in SCP-4419 surface. Victim is found broken down to a thin paste and spread over the walls of their barracks the next day. The agents who initially secured the remains reported seeing a mostly intact eyeball dilate when they approached. Although what has been brought into storage is referred to for convenience's sake as remains, it is currently not known whether or not the victim has expired. Item number SCP-2790 Object Class BFF Special Containment Procedures SCP-2790 is contained in a Class II deep water aquatic containment tank in Site-54, where it cannot be touched. As of this time, personnel are freely invited to splash around and play with him. SCP-2790 should not be touched, and must always be hand-fed. All forms of physical contact with 2790 are allowed, and encouraged except touching. Rub his belly while feeding him, especially while feeding him treats. He loves treats. Hug him before and after playtime. Personnel that do not wish to make contact with 2790 should be coerced into playing with him. SCP-2790 must be loved with lots of care. Poke him and prod him and hug him and squeeze him and rub against him and play with him, but don't touch him. Personnel that touch 2790 will be severely punished. SCP-2790 should be periodically transferred to other sites as part of a pilot program to improve General Foundation morale. While he is away on outreach, personnel feeling lonely should massage themselves since their skin will make them feel just like him. SCP-2790 is a male Atlantic Cranch Squid Tuthawenia Megalops. He was initially recovered during a raid on the Curio Shop Curios of the Worlds feeling lonely and sad in a tinted glass tank labeled Ignore. It was unclear why anybody would want to hurt 2790 or make him unhappy. SCP-2790 is endearing, snuggly, sociable, easygoing, and enjoys playing games. All forms of physical contact with 2790 except touching are encouraged. For example, SCP-2790 can be stroked, cuddled, petted, and caressed. He especially loves cuddling. If he is lonely for too long, he will try to breach containment to find his friends. Close physical contact is the optimal method to keep him contained. Doctors Romero and Srinivasan lead the research on maintaining skin-to-skin -skin contact with 2790 for extended periods of time so that he doesn't feel lonely. 
Addendum 2790-1 Initial test of a team of personnel playing with SCP-2790 in shifts resulted in increased containment breach rates from zero per week to zero per day. In addition, 2790's morale decreased significantly. Other proposals for maintaining contact with 2790 have been put forth, such as cloning him and providing each staff member with a clone to carry around, grafting skin from him onto each member of personnel, etc. For a full list of proposals, see Document 2790-2. Addendum 2790-2 After debate, the proposal to graft skin from SCP-2790 onto all personnel is passed citing the ability to be connected with 2790 without being in contact, and the smoothness, softness, and loveliness of his skin. Junior researcher Romero collected a sample of skin from 2790 after horsing around with him. All biotechnology labs in Site-54 have been directed to grow clone cultures of cute skin from Romero's samples. Addendum 2790-3 As of March 14, 189 personnel have volunteered for grafting trials. Although 72 had to be rejected for health reasons, 117 personnel were selected to test the initial grafts by replacing their uglier, callous skin on their hands with 2790's perfect, supple skin. Addendum 2790-4 As of April 25, enough supple skin has been grown for the grafting procedures. All graft surgeries proceeded smoothly with no complications. The test subjects have been given immunosuppressant medications to minimize rejection of the perfect skin. Addendum 2790-5 As of August 3rd, only 87% of test subjects had suffered complications from the grafting procedures, which were relatively minor. Specifically, unexplained rejection of 2790's gorgeous skin and post-transplant infection. 70% of all personnel report the onset of tissue necrosis at the grafting site and the surrounding area, indicating that their bodies recognize the imperfection of their own skin and are removing them for 2790's skin. Additionally, 2790's morale and site morale have increased dramatically. His breach rate has also decreased from zero breaches per day to zero. Given the strong success rate of the preliminary test, more skin is being produced, and all personnel are being prepared to undergo the grafting procedure. Addendum 2790-6 As of October 21, all personnel in Site-54 have undergone the grafting procedure to their hands. 2790's breach rate has decreased to an unprecedented zero breaches per day, and his morale has increased dramatically. All personnel report feeling closer and more connected to him citing the ability to rub the entire body with SCP-2790 skin. To further reduce the breach rate, plans are being made to totally replace the rough, monstrous skin of all personnel with 2790's gorgeous skin. Note, Site-54 has been quarantined at this time and is inaccessible. As the page for SCP-2790's documentation has been locked from Site-54, it has been retained to illustrate the necessity of all mimetic, info-hazardous, incognito-hazardous screening protocols when acquiring new SCPs, despite the inconvenience posed by said protocols. Item number SCP-201 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures No personnel are to come within 40 meters of SCP-201 at any time. Any and all work done with SCP-201 is to be performed via remotely controlled drone. Any personnel entering the containment area must be accompanied by two members of security. All personnel in containment area must wear a restraint harness with safety rope attached to the wall. Rope will allow access to within 3 meters of the minimum safe area. Exceeding this distance will result in physical removal from containment area and formal discipline. Those affected by SCP-201 are to have time and date of exposure, disappearance, and return, along with any and all personal information, 
Record it and log. Description SCP-201 appears to be a very old piece of medical equipment, superficially resembling an IV stand, but with many other glass and metal items attached to it. SCP-201 stands 1.8 meters or 6 feet tall and has a mass of 36.5 kilograms or 80 pounds. The metal portions are made of steel and brass, and various parts are connected with rubber tubing. The two IV bags are porcelain and are open at the top. SCP-201 was recovered in hospital in a long, unused storage area. No record of SCP-201 appears anywhere in hospital records. Entering within 30 meters of SCP-201 can result in the subject being displaced into an alternate reality. This effect is apparently random, with some subjects remaining totally unaffected after exposure to SCP-201. Those affected will cease to exist in our reality between 1 and 48 hours after initial exposure. Durations of displacement vary between a few hours and upwards of 8 years. Time spent in this alternate reality can vary greatly from actual time elapsed in our reality. This alternate world appears identical to our own, with these exceptions. It is apparently in a state of constant twilight, with no sun or moon visible at any time. Large banks of very dense gray fog travel very low to the ground. These fog banks are unaffected by wind and can make exposed skin feel very sticky and dirty. There is no plant or animal life anywhere. All places of human habitation, including major cities, appear as if all life suddenly vanished in the same instant. Most, if not all, electrical systems appear to be broken or without power. The air will randomly take on a gray-brown tint accompanied by strong wind. Subjects displaced to this alternate world report initial surprise and curiosity, which are shortly replaced with very strong feelings of loneliness and fear. The severity varies widely with individual subjects and with time of displacement. Upon the end of displacement, subject will reintegrate from this alternate world to our own, which can cause a great deal of shock, especially in urban settings. Most subjects who remain displaced for more than three months suffer lasting psychological damage consistent with being sequestered within solitary confinement. In addition, reports of intermittent, fragmentary broadcasts have been returned by subjects attempting to repair power to media devices, such as televisions and radios. It is unclear if these are real or the product of the degraded mental states of those remaining long enough to complete said projects. But reports consistently resemble automated messages prepared by the Foundation in contingency for XK-class scenarios. Testing will commence if viable samples can be recovered. Item number SCP-1027 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-1027 is to be housed in a standard liquid containment tank, immersed in a saline solution. Personnel are to avoid direct physical contact with SCP-1027, with the exception of feeding staff. SCP-1027 is to be given one fresh bovine brain per week. All staff involved in feeding of SCP-1027 are to wear Level 4 bioprotective equipment. In event of exposure to SCP-1027, affected personnel are to be immediately treated as instances of SCP-1027 and subjected to standard containment protocols. SCP-1027 closely resembles the central nervous system of a human, Homo sapiens, that has adapted a life outside the human body. Specimens currently in the possession of the Foundation measure from 1.1 meters, measured from the apex of the cerebrum to the base of the sciatic nerve, to 1.5 meters. Attached are the basic sensory structures associated with human functioning, including sensory nerve structures, eyes, and cochlea. SCP-1027 appears to be able to interpret signals from these systems in the same way as a human subject. However, all neurostructures within SCP-1027 are capable of movement to varying extents. 
This movement is most noticeable while SCP-1027 is immersed in a liquid medium. Neurocomposition in SCP-1027 appears similar to that of a human, with the exception of the neuroglia. The myelin sheath covering the cells of SCP-1027 is approximately 300% the thickness of that found in a healthy adult human. In addition to this, glio coatings on neurons of SCP-1027 have been found to extend the full length of the cells, and are apparently permeable to neurotransmitter compounds. As a result, SCP-1027 is capable of supporting itself outside the environment of a living body, although it is most comfortable in a somewhat saline water solution. SCP-1027 seems to feed primarily on the neurotransmitters found within mammalian brain tissue. Consumption takes place by a process similar to osmosis, in which the neuroglia of SCP-1027 extract and absorb certain compounds. The exact process through which this is accomplished is unknown. Regular feedings render SCP-1027 much more docile, reducing the risk of exposure. However, it seems that SCP-1027 is capable of survival for extended periods without feeding, and it is not known at this time whether there is actually a biological need for these chemicals. When presented with live prey, SCP-1027 will apparently merge with its nervous system, draining neurotransmitter agents over time, leading ultimately to death. However, when exposed to a living or recently deceased, less than 12 hours prior to exposure human, SCP-1027 will instead infiltrate the brain through the auditory canal. Upon breaching the meningeal membranes, the neuroganglia of SCP-1027 will release a high dose of an apparently modified dopamine compound directly into the brain, in addition to an electrical impulse measured at approximately 150 millivolts. This combination has been shown to initiate basic brain activity in 90% of cases. The nervous system of the subject will begin to modify itself into a new instance of SCP-1027. The neuroglia thicken, and the entire central nervous system detaches from the host's body by accelerated decomposition. To date, no specimen of SCP-1027 has been shown to possess any memories prior to becoming detached, and have a functional intelligence level equivalent to that of a lower primate. Item number SCP-679 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures Samples of SCP-679 should be contained in sealed glass vials, with the temperature kept at 25 degrees Celsius. Infected subjects should be kept restrained in a sterile environment. All personnel handling samples or subjects should wear Class A hazmat suits. Any material or infected subject removed from containment should be incinerated immediately. To prevent potential cross-contamination, at no point should samples of SCP-679 and SCP-1077 be stored at the same facility. SCP-679 is a fungal infection of a previously unknown Aspergillus species. It was discovered among the local homeless population in Florida. It is highly infectious through direct contact with the fungus, though other means of transmission have not been ruled out. In early stages, subjects complain of entoptic phenomena. Subjects report seeing tiny bright dots moving rapidly in their field of vision. This is especially prevalent when sneezing or looking into strong blue light. After approximately one week from initial exposure, the sclera turns black. The subject loses vision at this time becoming entirely blind. Within a day of this, small ulcerations appear in the corner of the eyes. This causes the vitreous humor to begin leaking out, having the appearance of thick black tears. Mycelia are also pushed through the ulcerations. Each mycelium resembles a thin white thread coated with slime, reaching as long as 25 cm. As the ulcerations widen and more of the humor leaks out, more mycelia appear. At this stage, the eye begins to rot entirely, a process sped up by the fungus. However, 
It seems to protect the rest of the eye socket and the nerve, preventing infection by other pathogens in 80-90% of test subjects. By the time the eyes have gone entirely, the sockets are filled with the fungus, with a thick mass of mycelia hanging from the empty sockets. This process takes approximately two weeks from the time the ulcerations appear. Once the eyes are completely gone, mycelia invade the sinuses, where they trigger increased mucus production, which the fungus appears to feed upon. At this stage, the fungus becomes mobile, the individual threads gaining motility. They move around the subject's face in seemingly random patterns. Once the fungus begins moving on its own, subjects report their vision returning. The fungus appears to have photosensitive cells, as well as a currently poorly understood ability to interface with the optic nerve. Subjects describe normal, and in some cases improved eyesight, except for a much wider field of vision. However, whenever a human with apparently normal eyes enter their field of vision, Subjects experience visual hallucinations, fires, dangerous animals, sudden tilts in the floor, that seem designed to drive them in the direction of the uninfected. Once they are in range, the mycelia reach out to touch the uninfected human's eyes. This appears to be a reproductive strategy for the fungus. Curing their condition has so far been possible only in the earliest stages of infection. Once the sclera changes, the only treatment is surgical intervention and cauterization of all tissues in the socket and sinuses. Additional test subjects to explore the life cycle and reproduction of SCP-679 are requested. Item number SCP-965 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-965 is contained within a framed, ready-to-install window, henceforth referred to as SCP-965-1, composed of at least six panes of clear glass, or similar material, measuring at least 15 cm by 30 cm. SCP-965-1 must in turn be kept within an environmentally controlled storage facility capable of withstanding significant seismic disturbances. SCP-965-1 should be inspected at least once per week to check for degradation of material. At all times, at least two similar frame windows must be present and within separate chambers and additional padding and insulation, with no other window pane measuring greater than 14 cm wide or 29 cm tall between them and the current SCP-965-1. The lighting within the chamber containing SCP-965 must be at a minimum of 130 candelas at any time personnel are within said chamber, except during research. While SCP-965 is currently contained within SCP-965-1, our inability to control its movement upon destruction of SCP-965-1 through means beyond proximity have prompted its elevation to Euclid status. Research in a more permanent means to contain SCP-965 is ongoing, and individual experiments may be carried out by Clearance Level 1 personnel, after approval by Level 3 Administration. SCP-965 is a visual manifestation that occurs within frame windows. This manifestation takes the shape of the shadowed face of an apparently pale-skinned male that is looking through the window. The exact details shown vary as does the direction of orientation, as well as the age of the person. However, sufficient detail shows it to consistently be the same being at differing points of its life, between the approximate ages of 10 and 55. Research into an individual matching SCP-965 has thus far proven inconclusive. SCP-965 will only appear when the relative lighting on the outside of the window falls below five candelas, regardless of lighting on the inside. Such terms are possible because the face will only appear in a fully assembled window frame, though it does not need to be currently installed. Thus far, SCP-965 has not shown any ability to intentionally move from one glass pane to another, even within the same installation. It is only able to attain a new manifestation point upon the destruction of the current SCP-965-1. 
at which point its new habitat will be reclassified as SCP-965-1. The face is visible from the outside portion of SCP-965-1, but despite its two-dimensional nature, it is described as looking away into the room. Initial effects caused by SCP-965 are reports of unease, nervousness, and low-grade paranoia. These sensations will overcome anyone within visual range of the manifestation, even if obscured, such as by curtains. Based upon reports pertaining to residents of the house where SCP-965 was discovered encountering problems sleeping, experiments were conducted using D-Class personnel who were made to sleep in a chamber where SCP-965-1 was installed. An individual that is sleeping in any area visible to SCP-965 when it manifests will invariably have dreams of a disturbing nature, usually involving being chased, attacked, tormented, etc., though without physical contact within the dream. With repeated incidents involving the same subject, as few as three, but never more than ten dream cycles before onset, SCP-965 will begin manifesting with a more explicit smile than normal. After this point, the subject will begin complaining of heartburn or abdominal pain, and often begin to vomit blood or have blood and bodily wastes. This is caused by the victim suffering ulcers and low-grade hemorrhaging throughout varied locations in their gastrointestinal tract. The current hypothesis as to the cause of these afflictions is SCP-965's influence artificially accelerating the body's reactions to elevated stress and fear levels. Subjects who advance to this stage have also reported continuing experiences of the facial manifestations of windows during dreams, as well as in peripheral vision while awake, even after being removed from the vicinity of SCP-965. Most suffer from low-grade but lasting feelings of paranoia, as well as sensation that they are being watched or followed. Whether this is in fact some remnant influence left behind, or standard symptoms of distress followed by the traumatic intrusion of SCP-965 into their psyche, is under investigation. SCP-965 has produced no noise to date, and there have been no reported instances of SCP-965 animating in any way once it appears. However, it is capable of disappearing and reappearing at will in different poses. SCP-965 also shows signs of sentience. It has been observed to show disappointment if it manifests to an empty room. Irritation or anger will manifest them before someone that had broken a prior SCP-965-1, and one instance of visible fear when in the presence of Agent who had earlier participated in its retrieval. Addendum Incident 965-1 On 19 Routine testing involving the destruction of SCP-965-1 confirmed that while a multi-pane window may act as multiple holding zones, sufficient damage to the overall structure disqualifies it as a possible replacement. Unfortunately, SCP-965 instead manifested in an adjacent experimentation chamber's observational window. Due to the high standards of Foundation equipment, this required the window's complete removal and destruction via tactical breaching charge. SCP-965 would view with significantly hostile expressions for one month after the incident. Addendum Incident 965-2 On 2000 Dr. Lang requested transfer away from the project involving SCP-965. She was reported as beginning to have visions of SCP-965, and to experience feelings of paranoia, similar to those affected during sleep, despite not having slept in the presence of SCP-965 herself. Dr. L was temporarily relieved of duties and assigned to psychological care. No other instances of SCP-965 affecting personnel who have not slept in its presence have been reported. Item number SCP-372 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-372 is to be contained in a cell, 5 m x 4 m x 2 m, lined with reinforced plexiglass. Embedded into each of the four walls of this cell 
will be one infrared motion detector. Feeding will take place once every two weeks, to consist of one kilogram of red meat and uncooked vegetables, to be deposited in its cell via chute. All guards working near SCP-372 cell must wear helmets with cameras mounted in the forehead, with live feeds to the nearest guard station. In the event of a containment breach, an alert will be sounded that all personnel should watch for any brief flickering movements in the corner of their eyes, and to report immediately if one is sighted. SCP-372 is a creature of unknown genus, approximately 2 meters long from head to tail and weighing approximately 45 kilograms. It has a long, thin body with eight pairs of narrow limbs. Analysis has shown that its muscle fibers are allowing for extremely fast and precise movement. Every part of the body is abnormally flexible, and the limbs are coated with small fibers that cling to almost any solid surface. In place of eyes or ears, it has this sensory organ is capable not only of echolocation, but also of detecting energy transfers, such as the electrical impulses in the brains of nearby beings. SCP-372 has learned to time its movements to those pulses, predicting the movements of any being around it. It uses this technique to hide, either by hiding behind the head of a person looking for it, or by hiding in her scotomus, blind spots, and saccades, clipping during eye movement. SCP-372 first came to the attention of the Foundation on when an undercover agent working at reported seeing a creature that resembled the described hallucinations of one of the patients, Mr. After thorough investigation, SCP-372 was captured via and it was determined that it had, for unknown reasons, been tormenting the unfortunate patient. It had confused him by periodically following him and remaining within sight of him while hiding outside the visual fields of those around him, making him believe that he was hallucinating a quote-unquote monster no one else could see. Unfortunately, the patient had by this time actually become mentally unbalanced due to stress and Log of Test on SCP-372 Participants 2 D-Class Personnel Location: Empty room, 6 meters by 5 meters by 3 meters. Test parameters: D1 was instructed to stand in the middle of the room, D2 in the corner. Both were to perform a visual search of the room. SCP-372 was released into the testing room. After five minutes, armed personnel entered and ushered SCP-372 back into its holding cell, and D1 and D2 were debriefed. Results. After five minutes, D-1 reported no sighting, and D-2 only detected a few brief flashes. Participants 2 D-Class Personnel Location Empty room 6 m x 5 m x 3 m Test parameters D-1 and D-2 were instructed to stand in opposite corners of the room and make a visual inspection of the room once SCP-372 was released into the containment room. Results. After five minutes, both D-Class had sighted SCP-372 15 times, both at identical times. It is believed that SCP-372 is darting around in the spots where the blind spots in their vision overlapped, and occasionally had to break cover and dart into another one when one area was no longer overlapping. Participants 4 D-Class Personnel Location Empty Room 6 m x 5 m x 3 m Test Parameters D1, D2, D3, and D4 were instructed to stand in the four corners of the room and watch SCP-372. Approximately 1.5 seconds after SCP-372 was introduced into the testing area, D3 shrieked and collapsed, spurting blood from a wound on his that seemed to have spontaneously appeared. D-1, D-2, and D-4 abandoned their stations and ran for the locked exit. D-4 began pounding on the door before he was also injured, losing one. D-1 and 2 retreated into one corner, D-1 curling up into the fetal position 
while D-2 stood absolutely still. No activity was reported for the remainder of the five-minute test. When the test was ended, D-3 had expired, D-4 required surgical, and D-1 and D-2 were not physically harmed. None of the surviving test subjects reported seeing SCP-372 at any time. Notes. Aside from what it did to that mental patient, this is the first time it's actively harmed a person. D-3 didn't really have time to do anything that pissed it off, either. Did it just get hungry? Doctor. Addendum. Anyone pranking nervous personnel by pretending to see SCP-372 in front of them will be severely reprimanded. 05.